Thank you, Heike. Uh, for those of you who didn't know, this is the Red Beard session. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't be a comedian. Um, so, so I'm going to be talking about how we're, we're trying to translate control strategies from autonomous walking robots into, into powered prosthetic legs. So amputees can spend up to three times more energy walking than able-bodied individuals. Uh, they really struggle to climb slopes like ramps and hills and especially staircases. Uh, just imagine having to walk sideways to navigate these uneven terrains and still falling over quite often because these are, these are real challenges that many amputees face. And so these problems are essentially caused by the fact that most clinically viable prosthetic <coughs> legs don't replace the power generating capabilities of the muscles in the biological limb. But recently we're seeing the development of new power limbs that do have the capability of restoring this lost function, but they're very difficult to control. And so we see here this, this individual has two powered knees, but he still needs canes to maintain his balance. So the most common way of controlling these devices at the moment is to divide up the gait cycle into multiple discrete control models or discrete phases. Each, each discrete phase having its own reference trajectory or impedance parameters, which all need to be very carefully tuned by a clinician to get them just right for a particular person and for a particular task. And also sometime, uh, sometimes in recent, uh, recent literature, we've seen the introduction of even newer uh, muscle reflex models and so forth that are more biomimetic, but have even more parameters that need to be tuned. And so what we're seeing here is a real trade-off between simplicity and the performance or the biomimicry in powered devices but it doesn't have to be this way if we use some control principles from robotic locomotion uh, where uh, we've seen some really great advances in the past decade, many of them presented at this very conference. Uh, now, some of these approaches have not yet been translated into the area of physical rehabilitation, but given the capability of these new devices we're seeing, it really is time to bridge this gap with what I would argue is, is control theory is, is the best way to do this. And so in this talk, I'm, gonna, I'm going to present how we're using virtual constraints which has been very successful in these robots and applying it to this particular prosthetic leg. <coughs> now this begs the question as to well, what is a virtual constraint? Well, that, 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 that should, then, uh, should, should then ask uh, what kind of behavior do we want out of the prosthetic leg? And so this is where we have the idea of effective shape of the stance leg during locomotion. So we look at able-bodied walking and the effective shape is the trajectory of the center of pressure which is Look, which is evaluated from the perspective of the shank, so it's in a shank-based reference frame. And so the center pressure is the point on the planar sole of the foot where the ground reaction force is exerted. We can measure that using a force plate. We can also attach markers to the shank to define a reference frame that's attached to the leg. So this is a moving <coughs> reference frame. And then we can watch the locomotion. <coughs> Whoop, Getting on my secrets, all right. And so Andy Hansen discovered that when you look at this center pressure trajectory from the perspective of the leg, of the shank, it follows a constant curvature trajectory. In other words, this means that our foot is deforming and our ankle joint is moving in such a way that we have the sensation of rolling over our leg in a nice, smooth, efficient manner. In other words, our center of mass moves as though we have rocker feet. And we know how to model rocker feet using kinematic constraints. It's been done since the 90s on passive dynamic blockers. It's just saying that the distance from the center of pressure to the center of rotation is always a constant R. And so this gives us a simple kinematic constraint to characterize the entire stance phase, or the, excuse me, the entire single support phase of locomotion, which in the coordinates of the leg is a function that takes as an input the center of pressure and it gives us an output the correct leg angle. Now because the center of pressure moves in a strictly increasing manner from the heel to toe during steady walking, if we know where the center of pressure is, then we know where we are in the gait cycle. So it's a mechanical representation of the gait cycle phase. So a prosthesis can then measure the center of pressure using a load cell to determine where its joint angle should be as the human body is moving above the leg. Human body influences where the center of pressure is, and then the angle co, co varies. And we can enforce this relationship using feedback control theory, output linearization in particular, to linearize the output dynamics associated with this constraint and enforce the desired behavior. Now, what's, what's amazing about this approach is that by choosing the effective shape as our constraint, it's invariant with respect to the walking speed, the body weight, and the heel height of the user, which would constitute a really huge advance in the, in the field of prosthetics. And so we're actively trying to implement this strategy on the prosthetic leg we see here, which is the Vanderbilt leg, 
which is being developed by Michael Goldfarb and his group at Vanderbilt University. And so this is part of a large collaboration where at the Center for Biomedical Medicine, we're developing the control system and the neural interface and, um, on the hardware that's been provided for us by Michael Goldfarb. And so I have to acknowledge the, the great work of my colleagues at the Center for Biomedical Medicine because this would not have been possible without them. Uh, but right here we have our first experiment, which just took place a couple weeks ago, using this control strategy. So what we're seeing here, and it, it's a little rough because in particular, um, the subject is not an amputee, we try it on ourselves first. But what you're seeing here is that the center of pressure is moving forward towards the toes, and when that happens, that, that causes the power push-up that you're observing. Now this is an artifact of the constraint that we are enforcing. Because our, our ankle foot complex is not a rocker foot, so you have to create power to make it behave as one. And another way to think about this is that as the, as the center of pressure approaches the toes, and the torque begins to increase, well that's gonna also influence the movement of the center of pressure. So what we have here is a positive force feedback loop, which we know that humans use. And so this is just one part of the broader vision of translating control strategies from robotic locomotion into higher performing wearable control systems that would help a variety of different people with different impairments, starting with amputees, but Steve, a shout out to the next talk, also can be used in other areas as well. So I'd like to acknowledge the U.S. Army and the Maurice and Burroughs Welcome Fund for their support, and now answer your questions. passive rocker foot, we actually can control, one, how fast we're moving along that arc, right? So the tangential velocity along that arc, but also how long that arc is. So I'm not saying that the foot gets longer, but remember, this is a moving reference frame. So if the angle, if the, if the, if the ankle angle is moving further, then this arc is actually going to get longer. So that's how the power enters into the system, by changing how fast you're moving along that arc, and then, and, and yeah. It's, it's a little noisier, uh, you're right, it won't, it won't necessarily be uh, monotonic, especially if you're perturbed, it won't be monotonic. That's okay, because what we have here is you have a characterization that if, if you're moving this way, on, in this direction, and you get perturbed and you move backwards, well, by measuring the center of pressure location with the load cell, you can then co-vary or adjust the ankle angle appropriately to accommodate a perturbation. Oh, well, we haven't looked at that yet. We have only planar uh, actuation, but there's also some evidence to suggest that lateral balance may have some um, sensory feedback from the, the mechanoreceptors or, or Golgi tendon organs that provide proprioception. So just to follow up, uh, we're looking at kinematic slider. Yeah. What are the effects of reactive Yeah. something that we should think a little bit more about. Um, you know, we, we, we've had some preliminary success experimentally, but we haven't done enough work yet, so I'm very much interested in looking into that. So yeah, it, it would essentially, well, this is, this is only the shank, but you can also define a reference frame on the thigh, which would then give us a kinematic strength for the knee. So anyway, the point is, yeah, it's, uh, this would be the knee, but if you had the reference frame attached to the thigh, then this would be the hip. So that, that's more or less where, where the center of mass is. But why do you connect the second leg to the Because that's where the marker is. So the, we're, first we're looking at a shank reference frame, 
which is part of the equation. We could also look at the, at the thigh reference frame too. Okay, thank you. We'll have to ask okay. the next question. Yep.